Uh, I'm, I'm going to start out uh, with uh, a story about, uh, and this is, this is a, a dream that I had. So I'm just going to tell you about a dream that I had. Uh, uh, in this dream, I'm at my house, and I go to the cabin next door to my house. And I go in the cabin, and I start rummaging around and doing some work out there, and suddenly I find a pair of shoes. They're not my shoes. And I realized they belong to the person who used to own the property, who's dead now, and who is long gone. And I decided that that person probably never walked in my woods, and I needed to get those shoes up into my woods to the highest part of my property. So I grab the shoes, and I run out the door, and I go charging up the hill. And in classic dream fashion, I'm like running up the hill, and I'm not getting tired. And I'm like running, running faster, and I'm getting tired. This is amazing. This is Faster, and I'm sprinting up the hill, going as fast as I can. I'm carrying the shoes with me, and the still the hill's getting steeper and steeper. And I'm using my hands, and I'm climbing, and then, then the trail starts getting narrower, and, I'm, and then there's like ledges, and I start getting out on a rocky ledge, and I'm, you know, the trail's getting really skinny, and I'm holding on to branches and trees, and it's getting really skinny, and I'm like, there's a cliff down here, and it's like straight up over here, and I'm like edging out, and I'm getting further and further, and getting closer to the highest point, and. And I'm coming right around a little corner, and then there's a crack in the rock, and a big hawk comes screaming out of the crack right in my face. You know, and it's uh, flapping its wings, and it's making noises, and I'm terrified, and I'm trying to back away, but I'm on a little ledge, and I can't get away, and so I'm, I'm just like pulling away, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna leave the shoes here, and then I'm gonna like go away. So I leave the shoes, <laughs> and I like work my way off the ledge, and then I go back down the hill, and that's the truth. So, okay, so what does this have to do with talking to trees? Um, so what this has to do with talking to trees is, is, is this talk is going to deal a lot with the idea of like boundaries and edges and uh, the sort of the spaces that exist between like two different places in your mind or in the world. Um, and what uh, and the, the punchline of that story about the dream is that it's all 100% true, it happened in real life. And while it was happening, I was like saying to myself, this is like a dream. This, I, I can't usually run up hills without getting tired. Is this a dream? Am I dreaming? And the whole process, and like when the, this bird of prey comes out of the rock, I'm like, I don't have any like nesting falcons on my property. Like, I don't know what this is all, this is just not normal. Whole time I'm saying to myself, is this a dream, is this a dream? And it wasn't. It was all real. I came down the hill, I just went back to work and started messing around the cabin again, doing whatever project I was doing. <laughs> so that story shows this boundary. There's like the subconscious and the conscious mind. And all of a sudden, that boundary got a little bit blurry for just a little while there for me. So I had like something that seemed like a dream, but it was happening in real life. But I was and I was in real life, but wondering if maybe I'm on the other side of that boundary. Maybe I'm somewhere else. And I don't realize it, because oftentimes when you're in a dream, you think it's real life, and then you wake up and find out that you're in fact it's a dream. You are on the other side of the boundary from where you thought you were. Um, so that's why I wanted to start out with that story, because when you're talking to trees, or, or approaching the idea of talking to trees, you have to think about that fact that you're crossing a boundary or you're pushing a boundary, and you're going somewhere that you may not have gone before, or you may not be familiar with, or where you may have been but not realized it at some part of your life. Okay? For most people, myself included, I was a biology major, I grew up in Indiana, from a Christian family, things were about science and facts, they were black and white, they were very rigid boundaries. And so trees like fell in the same category as like rocks and mountains and stuff like that. They were inanimate objects, like you don't talk to inanimate objects. You can have like other things, like birds and animals, you know, you can have sort of a relationship with them and talk to them, but things like trees and rocks and mountains, they're in a separate category. They're over here on this side of the boundary, things you don't talk to. And then like things like humans and animals, birds and pets, those are on this side, things that you could have a relationship with and things that you could talk to. And so there's the boundary that I'm going to be talking about tonight, is that place between where you maybe one way of thinking about trees versus another way of thinking about trees. Um, and so when I talk about talking to trees, talking is like a form of communication. And when I think about communication, I think about like two, two concepts, communication and relationships. They kind of go, they're kind of interconnected with each other. 
And so just to define some of my terms as I'm talking about this, um, for me, like relationships, basically, they exist when there is communication between two um, entities, whatever you want to call them. So, and by communication, I mean like a message is given and a message is received. That's all it takes, okay? So um, when I'm teaching my class here, I sometimes use an example when I'm talking about this concept of relationships in the forest. It's like if you, if you walk onto a subway in a crowded city, you might get on a, a crowded subway and stand next to somebody, and then they throw an elbow at you, and then you move away from them, and then you all get off at your respective stops. That was a relationship. It was a tiny, tiny little relationship, but it was a relationship because there was communication, there was an interaction between two entities, two different people. You stepped up, said, I want to stand in this space. That was what you were communicating. The person throws an elbow. They're saying, I don't want you in this space. That's what they're communicating. So they received your message. They're rejecting your message. And you're moving away and saying, OK, I hear what you're saying. Your message is you don't want me standing here. And you go away. No words were spoken. But a lot of messages went back and forth, and that's a tiny relationship. Okay, you have an interaction with that person, you have a relationship. You never see them again. Tiny relationship. You know, on the other end of the relationship spectrum would be you know somebody that you decide to spend the rest of your life with, and, and you actually pull it off and do spend the rest of your life with them. That's the whole, the other end of the spectrum. It's like somebody you have deep understanding with, and you can you know have like communicate without talking, but in a good way, <laughs> like without throwing elbows. Um, so you, you have like long, uh, there's a wide spectrum on which relationships exist. And the concept of talking with trees and relating to your forest also exists on a very wide spectrum. So there's a lot of places to enter into the concept of relating to the forest. Um, and I'm going to you know, be talking about several of those, but just remember it's a spectrum. It's not that rigid black and white boundary, in this case, it's sort of a long, wide spectrum of where those relationships can, can be and where they can fall. So, um, all right, let's see. So, um, as far as the concept of, of sort of talking to trees or trees being able to communicate, um, it is possible that we are at this moment at kind of a paradigm shift in our understanding of, of forests and trees. Um, there's a tremendous amount of new research out there um, which is showing from the scientific end of things that trees actually have very complex uh, ways of communicating both with each other and with the environment around them. There's, uh, and I'm, I'm not an expert, I was a biology major, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, you know, so now I spend most of my time running a sawmill and working in the woods. Um, but I have, you know, do some reading and I listen to the radio and I, I hear a lot of stuff and I know that uh, forestry is, on the whole, is, is, is starting to change and there's new, very cutting edge research showing, um, you know, particularly in the, like, the Michael Reisel uh, little bits, of, all the roots of trees have fungus associated with them and fungus has mycorrhizal, these little hair-like structures. Um, and they're finding out that trees can actually communicate from tree to tree and actually throughout a whole forest using those uh, mycorrhizal, uh, little, little hairs that go through that. And so they can be transferring information back and forth to each other. Um, and that is a very revolutionary concept. Nobody ever thought of that before. Um, and the more there's, that the scientists are studying these things, the more they're finding out. And so. I, it's akin to sort of like, if you think about, you know, a, a thousand years ago or so, or 1,500 years ago, if you were in a room like this, with this many people, and, and all the people in the room were the sort of most learned people of their day, all this, this, the smartest people of both science and religion, and somebody stood up and said, you know, I've got this new idea, I think the sun is not, you know, it, it is the middle of our solar system, and I don't think, the, I don't think we're in the middle of the solar system. Well, all the most learned people who have been studying their whole lives, science and religion, which then were kind of a lot more combined than they are now, but, um, would have said, no, you're wrong. Like, and in fact, we, might, we maybe need to take you out of Estonia or something, because um, <laughs> that's really, really wrong and really, really bad. And, and it's because it's a frightening concept to sort of change what you think is foundational to something else. And so um, there is some pushback to some of the modern science of looking at the forest and saying that it's a complex organism which can communicate and in fact sometimes even show emotion and have feelings because that would mean 
that people have to rethink how they do forestry. And that's kind of a scary concept for you know, a large sector of the population who relies on forest products to build things. Um, and so it's, it's, it's like there's, a, there's, there's one of those, this side of the line, that side of the line. There's like this new idea of like maybe they can communicate, and there's the old idea saying, no, they're inanimate objects, and you just treat them like inanimate objects. Um, so, uh, but that moment is now, and the science is really starting to advance along that edge. And I'm talking about science right now, but in the course of this talk, I hope to also be sort of working on, on another spectrum, which would be the spectrum of sort of like the spiritual end of things to the scientific end of things. So that is another spectrum that you can talk about these relationships on. Um, you can have the strictly science-based, you need facts, you need research, you need to have, you know, independently verified papers, and then there's the spiritual end where you don't need to have any of that stuff, and you can still be communicating in other ways which don't rely on, on the facts and the data and like hard you know, evidence on this side. And there can be communication on both ends of the spectrum and all places in between. So communication is not just isolated to one point or another. It happens all the way along that spectrum. And that's another thing to sort of keep in mind as I'm doing my talk, that you know, I'm going to be moving around to different places on that spectrum as I'm, as I'm talking about these things. So, so, since this is yes tomorrow, we tend to do things like how to, um, you know, how do you do this? And so the, the next little bit of the talk is kind of like getting into a little more of the nitty gritty. So I've got sort of like what you can think about doing that sort of broad sections and then I've got like very specific how you can go about doing it. Um, and so some big overarching concepts in the like what to do to start listening and talking to trees. I gave away the first one. It's listen. Okay. So listening is critical for communication. Um, if you're trying to have communication and somebody's not listening, then you don't have a relationship. You don't have communication. Okay. You know, if you walked into that person's space in the subway and they gave you an elbow and you just ignored it completely, that's not, there wasn't communication. You didn't get the message. Um, and so you don't have, a, I would say by my definition, you don't have a relationship yet until you get the message. You know, if you think, oh, maybe that was an accident, you, you haven't actually received the message. Um, so listening is the way to receive the message. Okay? And listening takes many forms. Sometimes it's just like plain old listening, closing your mouth, getting out in the woods and listening. Um, and sometimes it can be, you know, listening to a story on the radio or listening to what you're reading in a book. Um, there's all kinds of listening. Um, the next thing I would say as a broad concept is express your intentions. Um, you can do it in your mind, on paper, it doesn't matter, to your best friend, to your therapist, but you know, you want to put out there into the world that you want to be communicating with trees and what you want to get from it or what you're hoping to do with this. Or, you know, just like, or, and if you don't know, that's fine. You can put that out there. Somehow expressing your intentions is a very important piece of starting a communication process. Um, and the next thing, it kind of overlaps with the listening part, is learn. So don't ignore the facts part of that spectrum, the science facts part. If you're more of like kind of a woo-woo person and you really like the spiritual side, don't ignore all the facts that are out there because that's a whole area of entering into relationship that you can gain a lot from. And if you're a facts person, then you want to be pushing your boundaries the other way. And you want to be looking more at like, well, how can I maybe think about relating to these trees on a non-scientific level and push that boundary just a little bit. Not everybody's comfortable. No, you know, I'm not comfortable way over here on this boundary or way over here on this boundary. I'm somewhere in the middle. But wherever you are, you want to be sort of like move your edges. Find your edge and then just push it just a little bit so you're like gaining a broader sense of the relationship. It's like building a relationship with a person. You can sort of have a good, casual friendship for a while, but if you want to become deeper or something, you've got to push that edge. You have to invite them to the party. You have to you know, say hello to them on the train. You have to take that next step to go past that first edge that you come to in that relationship. Um, so, and then the next, the last, last thing as a general concept is be open-minded. Um, and it takes a lot of open-mindedness to do this. If you as, as mammals, you know, as the way that we humans have evolved, our brains really like to put things in categories. 
And they like to say that, and, and that's because, you know, as, as, we were, as an animal, it's helpful to know that this is dangerous, it might kill me, this is good, and I need more of it. Like, those are really important big categories, and as a mammal, those are like evolutionarily important for us to survive. We needed to have those. But unfortunately, it takes, it, it causes us to want to compartmentalize everything in our brains. And so, you, you're, you're going to want to take whatever you know, put it in those little categories, and not, not let those categories play with each other. Not push those, those boundaries closer to each other. And what I'm saying is that being open-minded means allowing in some of the things that might seem like they're in the, in the danger side, or the wrong side, or the bad side, however you want to classify it. Whatever your brain has taken those things and put them in that box, you want to push that edge and look at them. Doesn't mean you have to accept them or do anything about them, but you want to, you want to go there so that you can learn. Because it's a relationship. You're trying to build a relationship. And what you can sometimes find is that, like, oh, that edge actually isn't an edge. That's, it's a spectrum, and I can actually go way further along here and have a way higher quality relationship if I'm open-minded, if I'm willing to go somewhere where I might not have gone before to feel comfortable with that. Um, OK, so those are generalizations. So, um, so here's a few more. Uh, these are some specific things that um, that, that I personally have used to try to build my relationship with my woods. And in building my relationship with my woods, you can also, talking to trees, building my relationship with the woods, those are basically the same kind of concept as when I'm talking about building my relationship. I'm talking about communicating with individual trees and with my woods. So here's some things that I've used to do that, okay? So um, I, I tend, you know, I grew up in Indiana, as I said, in this Christian family, the, the Protestant work ethic runs deep in my family, and uh, it was very hard for me to go into the woods and not be working. Um, and I found that one of the best things for me to do to start being able to listen was to go into the woods and not be working. Not looking for what trees I need to harvest, not carrying a handsaw with me to do some basal pruning, you know, cutting limbs off, not making trails or marking boundaries. Those are all great things, and those are really good ways to start building relationships. But when I, for me, to take it to a deeper level, to move my point on that spectrum, I had to go into the woods and not be working, okay? So working is a fine way to build that relationship. If that's your starting point, that's a great way to get out into the woods and start a relationship with the trees. That's a way to talk to your woods, to talk to your trees is by working in your woods, and I strongly encourage people to do that. For me, I didn't have any trouble with that part. I had trouble stopping working and listening to what was going on. So just being out there, listening. No tools, no plan for work. That was a big one for me. Okay, Being quiet in the woods. So going up and just not saying things and trying to, to listen, focus on what I'm actually hearing, like audible sounds, so that I'm not just running things through my head. Like, what do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do tonight? Does that tree over there need to come down? Well, maybe it does. I don't know. You know, like trying to shut off that running commentary in my brain and just be there, listening to the auditory things that are happening around me. That was also very helpful for me to start to feel like I was relating on a deeper level with my woods, not just on a practical level with my woods. Um, so. Uh, if you have a woods, you want to learn about your particular place. And if it's your local park that you go to, that's fine. It doesn't have to be yours ownership-wise, but it can be yours as in the place where you like to go. Um, learn about that place. So then go to that facts end of the spectrum and find out stuff about it. Learn its history. Learn its natural history. Uh, find out what kind of impact humans have had on it. Find out what kind of impact you know, the glacial period has had on it. You've got all sorts of places where you can go and learn about a place. And learning about a place is a great way to start developing a relationship with it. And then when you go to that place and you start interacting with individual trees, you'll have sort of a basis of knowledge to understand why that tree is there. And it will it helps. So like if you can imagine like that that tree speaks a foreign language. If you know something about its country, you'll have an idea of, a, you know, a, a, if you know where a person comes from, you can have some idea about what they might be doing, what they might be saying, even if you don't speak their language. And trees are the same way. If you learn about that location and you learn about those trees, 
you may not be able to speak tree language, but you're learning to understand something. That tree is going to be communicating to you through the information you're able to gather around, uh, about the place. So uh, this next one was a really tough one for me um, with, with my background, which was learning to recognize and act on feelings rather than science or knowledge. So it's very easy for me to go into a woodlot and see a tree, know how many board feet are in the tree, know whether or not it's good to harvest, whether the lumber is going to be of any decent quality, and look at the terrain, know whether I can extract it using the tools that I have with me. Those are really easy things for me to do. That, like, I mean, it's taken a long time for me to gain those skills, but those are things that I can do. It was a lot harder for me to go in and get a feeling in my gut about, like, should I take this tree down? Does that tree want to be taken down? Asking these questions that are strictly feelings-based. They have no basis in science, per se. Now, science might help me you know, make some, get some of those feelings, because I'll know, like, oh, that, that's a, I know scientifically that that tree is like a little overcrowded and it could use some thinning. And so then I might get a strong feeling that that tree needs to come down. But I'm looking for the feeling, not for the science. And that was a big step. And when you can start getting feelings and acting on them, that is a really great way to start really bumping up that communication, that relationship um, between you and a tree or you and the forest. Um, so um, remember that um, when you're pushing, when you're starting to communicate, um, that there's going to be times when it's when you don't get anything. <laughs> so. You, you know, it would be great for me to say that, like, go out there and just listen and things are going to come to you. You know, the woods is going to open up and you're going to, like, sort of have this amazing moment and, and the trees are going to speak to you and you're going to hear. It, it's not going to always be like that. For some people, it's hardly ever like that. Or, and maybe for some people, it's never like that. Some people can go out there and do it from day one. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. It's, it's not that there's one way to do it that's right and one way to do it that's wrong. I was, like I keep saying, there's a continuum spectrum, and you want to find your place in the spectrum, push the edges a little bit. So, um, so you, but remember that there's going to be times when nothing happens. So that's a good thing to remember for me. Like, because every once in a while, I'll start feeling like, oh yeah, I've got this thing dialed in. I, I can talk to trees, and then I'll go out there, and it's like I'm not hearing anything. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I, I, you know, like I wish I was hearing something, but there's nothing going on. And, and I like to remind myself, like, it's like when you call your best friend because you're in crisis and all they want to do is talk about their cat. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like that, where, like, you know, the woods may have other things on its agenda and you might want to go out there and hear, you know, something from them. But all the woods wants to do is talk about its cat. You know, like, so, like, you get that silence. Don't panic or freak out. Like, that's part of it. Like, that's just part of it. Regular human relationships. And it's, and, you have to expect the same kind of things in, if you're trying to build a relationship, um, even with something like a, like a tree or a forest. Um, okay, pushing your edges. So I brought four books with me um, that sort of illustrate the, the concept of pushing your edges. And these books sort of fall along a spectrum, so I'm just going to introduce them you know, uh, as they come on the spectrum. So uh, this is a book by Steve Long. It's called 38. Um, it's a locally published book, so it's, it's, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon or wherever you get books. You can also order it directly from Northern Woodlands Magazine, which is a great uh, magazine um, about uh, New England forests. Um, so Steve Long is a writer for Northern Woodlands, and I've also done some jobs for him. He's like a uh, neighbor a few miles away and, and uh, you know, like a peripheral friend, not a close friend. Um, but this is a book about the hurricane of 1938 that ripped through northern New England um, and really devastated the forests. Um, it was it deforested massive swaths of Vermont and New Hampshire um, and it was it was a pretty catastrophic event um, and it's it would be akin to you know like you know there's a lot of catastrophic natural events happening in the world these days if this happened again now it, it would be one of those um, so you know there would be you know billions of dollars of damage and you know lots of lives lost because it was it was quite an event. About every two or three hundred years, these hurricanes come through New England. Most people don't realize that because cultural memory doesn't usually extend back that far. Um, but um, this book talks about that in depth. 
Um, and the reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is that Steve's a forester, and he talks a great deal about the natural history of New England woods. Um, this is one of the best uh, books on why the forests looked like they did in 1938, um, and then what happened after that to make them look like they look today. It's fantastic. It was a real eye-opener. Um, and while I was uh, working for Steve uh, a couple winters ago, um, he had just finished this book, and I, I hadn't read it yet, but I was starting to read another book, which is the next one I'm going to bring up, which is uh, The Hidden Life, Hidden Life of Trees. And I was asking Steve about The Hidden Life of Trees. And Steve's like, well, you know, it was interesting, but I don't buy everything that he's saying. He's like, you know, I just I can't buy that trees are communicating with each other. Just, I, I can't do it, you know. So Steve, I know, has a very good relationship with his woods. Like, I respect the way that he relates to trees and the decisions he makes in his forest. I would trust him in my forest to make good decisions. Um, so good, solid relationship to trees. And although he wouldn't probably agree with me, I would say that he talks to trees, okay? <laughs> he doesn't think he talks to trees, but like, I know that he's getting information from them and he's giving them information. There's a two-way flow of information by my definition, he talks to trees. But when he read this book, which is science-based, he couldn't quite go to where the science in this book was. So, The Hidden Life of Trees just came out a couple years ago. And this book delves really deeply into the science of tree communication and tree communities. Um, and it's an excellent book. It's a really good read. I highly recommend it. I, I, I recommend all of these books. Um, but. Uh, so they talk about the, you know, the fungal things communicate, you know, with each other. They talk about, you know, the sense that trees can release rapidly if they, if there's a pest coming in one edge of a forest, the trees on that end can release a sense that all the rest of the trees pick up and they'll start to produce, you know, you know, resins or antigens or something, you know, depending on the species that will start to resist the insects coming in before the insects actually get there. So trees on this side of the forest communicating with trees on this side of the forest. So amazing stuff. Um, and trees, you know, showing emotion. Trees, there's, this, there's uh, some scientific evidence they found of like old trees that are about to die dumping their nutrients into the soil so that the younger trees around them can actually get the nutrients um, as quicker as the old tree dies, you know, rather than holding on to its, its nutrients. So um, he talks about different species having different personalities, like some of them are much more aggressive and some of them are much more, you know, magnanimous and like willing to give up their nutrients to the trees around them. So really, really interesting stuff, very science-based. Um, but pushing those boundaries hard, you know, and like someone like Steve Long can't quite make that leap in his mind to the trees being able to talk to each other. Like it just, it doesn't sit right with him. But he read it, he pushed his boundary. So like that's, that's what I'm talking about. So then the next book on the spectrum goes far to the, to the next end. So this is called Behaving as if the God of All Life Mattered. Um, so this is totally over on the woo-woo end of the spectrum. Um, so it's all about the spiritual stuff and very, very little about the scientific stuff. Uh, it's behaving as if the God in all life mattered. Okay, so you know this. The woman who wrote this is her, she sort of tells her personal story, and then she got this piece of land. I can't remember. It's I think it's on the east coast of the United States somewhere, a little bit south of here, and forms this sort of forest community and basically has like an intimate communication with it. Talks to it all the time. She has gardens. She you know makes makes products for sale from it. Um, but it's very, it is all based on like talking directly to the spirits of the trees and getting direct communication back from the spirits of the trees, the spirit of the, of the, the you know, the garden itself, um, you know, so it's very on the spiritual end. She talks a little bit about the science, but that's, there's, there's very little science in this book. It's all on the spiritual end. So I read this book, and it was a real eye-opener for me. This was like a great book for me, pushing my boundaries to be like, there, there's a whole other world way of looking at whole other world for me to look at, um, the sentence is not making any sense. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say, there's like a whole other way of looking at things. Um, and you know, where I don't have to base it on the science, I can base it on some other thing at a different part of the spectrum. So this book was great for me, I really enjoyed it. When I reread it recently, I found myself 
not enjoying as much. It was pushing me in a few other places that, that wasn't as comfortable. I don't recommend this one as strongly as I recommend the other ones, but that's probably because that's where I'm at right now. Um, you know, and also, this is a little dated. I think it came out quite a long time ago. Um, so there may be other ones I, that I have not encountered. But um, so those are three books from three different places on the spectrum um, that you can go to. And you know, there are many more books out there, obviously. Um, and then one book that is kind of like, I, I, I brought this one too. This is a new fiction book. It's called uh, The Over Story by Richard Powers. <coughs> and this one is great because I feel like it covers almost the entire spectrum um, from the science side to the metaphysical spiritual side. It's fiction, but it is heavily based in science. He did, I've heard a couple interviews with the author, and he did a ton of research for this book. So there's some really good hardcore science in here. But it's a fictional story, it's transgenerational, it follows like multiple families through multiple generations. Um, excellent book. It is a tragedy. <laughs> so, so if you're looking for a happy ending, I'm just going to tell you, because sometimes you know you need to have a book with a happy ending. <laughs> Just don't want to have it. Um, it's kind of devastating. There's like, you know, it's multi generational, so a lot of people die. <laughs> okay, so just putting it out there. That being said, I, it was fantastic. It was a great book. I really, really enjoyed it. I was depressed for a week, <laughs> but I really liked it and I strongly recommend it. Um, other people aren't quite as, you know, hate it. You know, books don't affect people. And just, same way they like me in it. Anyways, so okay, so those are some books. And, and those those I put those out there just so you can have an idea of where things fall on the spectrum and think about think about finding a book that pushes your edge, that moves you to a slightly different place, you know, in where you're relating to trees and where you're relating to, you know, you know, a wilderness community or a forest or you know, whatever the thing is that you're trying to get a relationship. Okay, so the next one on, on the how to do a list. Um, and this one's a, this one, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for some people also. And this is that you you need, well, it's a strong word. Let me just let me rephrase that. Don't be afraid of death, because communities out in the wild and communities like ours, death is part of the cycle. So there's no way around. Every single living thing on the planet is going to die. That's part of it. And recognizing that will really help you in that relationship with the forest. And the reason I put this in is because I see something happening when people start to recognize the, sort of the depth and the complexity of the forest and the possibility that there might be, you know, trees might have emotions and communications. The first thing that people want to do is say, don't, oh, don't cut down any trees. You know, don't kill any trees. And I would say that that is not a healthy place to go because that is putting up barriers, it's putting up a hard line and saying, like, we don't cross this line. There's nothing over here that we want. Only things on this side do we want. And I would say that a good relationship can exist even with death in the picture. Okay? And so finding a way to get a little more comfortable with that concept of death is, I feel, very important for relating to the woods. Because some of the best forestry practices out there, things that could be making your woods the healthiest, are going to involve cutting down trees. And cutting down trees is killing trees, and that's a it's a it's a kind of a hurdle to get over, especially when you start relating to trees on an individual basis. Um, so that being said, I would say that you know, in my personal experience of relating to trees, um, and I'll tell some stories at the end, um, I have found that that concept of like worrying about the tree dying is something that you can bring to the discussion with the tree. And, and it works. So that's my personal take on it in terms of dealing with death and recognizing that, that what you're doing out there with the chainsaw is killing stuff. Um, is you gotta bring that, you gotta bring it to the table, you gotta communicate it. Um, you know, if you go out and kill stuff and you haven't communicated, that's not as strong relationship building experience as communicating and then going out with the chainsaw. So, okay. Um, so let's see. Um, and in, in that vein, like that one thing, the simple thing, if you are going to be going out and harvesting trees is, and I try to do this, I, I don't successfully do it all the time because sometimes I get busy and I forget or I'm on a job or I, I just am not focused on that. 
but I try to check in with every single tree that I cut and just say, is it okay that I'm cutting you down? And then listen for a second to make sure I get an answer. And usually I've done my science homework well enough to know that what I'm doing is the right thing and so I can feel confident in those decisions. If I don't get any answer from the trees, if I'm not hearing anything that day, I can move forward with confidence that I'm still building a quality relationship with my woods when I cut that tree down. But if I get a no from the tree, that's where it gets tricky. <laughs> because I've already done my homework and decided to cut that tree down. Why is that why am I getting this gut feeling that says no? And and learning to be able to willing to listen to that no is a really important step in communicating with your woods, especially if you're going to be out harvesting trees, cutting down trees. It's listening for a no and then being willing to act on that. Because sometimes no is like, but this tree is in the middle of this logging road I need to build in order to get into my woods, and I'm getting a no from this tree. Do I have to move my whole road because of this one tree? Well, I don't know. Like, I can't answer that question. Only the person interacting with the tree can answer that question. Um, but I will tell you this from personal experience. If you do choose to listen to the tree and do something more difficult, move your logging road to a new location, that is a strong relationship building experience. If you ignore the tree and do what you want, there's no relationship building that happens there. And sometimes there's relationship bruising um, that can happen. So I will tell you that from personal experience. You may have a different experience, but that's my experience out in the woods. So, um, okay. So, um, the last little bit here is just a few uh, stories that I've got. Just these are personal experiences that I have had in working with the woods and in trying to, or failing to sometimes, communicate directly with trees um, as I'm working out in the woods. Um, so for me, as I've said before, it's listening to my gut. That's my edge that I, that I try to push a lot and I really try to, to do more <laughs> listening and less just moving forward with my job because the job is the most important thing to do. Um, I want to listen to my gut. So these are just a few stories from my own personal experience. Um, so this happened a long, long time ago uh, You know, when I first moved to Vermont. Um, and I hadn't really developed a sense of like listening to trees at that point. Um, but, uh, but this is a case of where a tree was really trying to tell me something. And I was actually, it was telling me so assertively that I heard it even though I wasn't really open to listening to the tree. And it was one particular spruce tree and it was, a, you know, I was doing some harvesting uh, along my lower edge of my property. And there was a, a really knotty spruce tree, lots of lower branches. Um, and so you may or may not know, but uh, you know the more branchy a tree is, the lower quality it, it is for lumber. So this tree had very little lumber value, um, and it was spreading out really wide. So it was taking up a big area. And from a forestry perspective, those are called wolf trees, and they're sucking up a lot of sunlight and a lot of a lot of space in the forest. And you usually cut those down, you harvest them, and just let them lay because you want a more mixed grouping of trees. You don't want this low quality tree that will never amount to anything. So I knew enough about forestry to know that that tree should come down and I was just like, I'm going to go cut that tree down. So I, I just took my chainsaw and I started working towards the tree. And every step I took toward the tree, I was getting jabbed by one of these. It was, there were so many lower branches. It was, it was like a thick and I couldn't even see the trunk of the tree. There were so many, but I, I'm like, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I'm working. And I kept getting like jab, poke, jab. And I mean, I've worked in the woods a lot, and I know how to avoid getting, you know, jabbed by a branch. And yet, this tree was really fighting me, and it was fighting me so much that I was thinking to myself, like, this tree is fighting me. Maybe I shouldn't cut this tree down. And then I'm thinking, that's ridiculous. Why am I thinking, don't cut this tree down? Just cut the tree down. You know, you've got a chainsaw. You know what forestry, good forestry is. Just cut the tree down. So I kept going. So I'm cutting and I'm falling and the chainsaw chain comes off and I have to go get tools and fix the chainsaw and I'm going back in. It took me a half an hour just to get into the trunk of the tree. Like there was that many like things going wrong. Um, and I finally got into the trunk of the tree and I cut the tree down and the tree falls over. And, and of course there's so many branches it actually stands up in the air. And I'm looking at the base of the tree 
and there's there's a there's a huge hole. So that was some animal's home there. Might have been a porcupine. Might have been who knows what. But um, you know, and I don't have any special affinity for porcupines. But I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I just ruined this animal's home. Um, I took away all its cover, and I created a big open space. And all this time, the tree was telling me not to cut it. And Yes, it's taking up you know, a 20 or 30 foot circle of my woods that could be growing productive trees of a higher quality, but also it could have just been supporting the life of this animal that, was, that had its den beneath the tree. And, and that was one of the early moments where I started being like, oh, maybe I, I could listen to the tree. Like maybe I, maybe I could do this. Like maybe I could have made a different decision. I didn't have to just force my way in there until I got my way in that situation. So. There was that I was the tree was doing its best to communicate to me. I was not listening, and I did what I wanted to do anyways. And it didn't ruin my day so much. It ruined some little animals' day, um, but uh, it's just it was like a small little moment. And most of the things that I can tell you about are just small little moments. You know, I haven't had any. You know, like the heavens opened up and the trees sang like a choir of angels, and I, you know, like those are the kind of moments that I tend to have. Maybe someday I will. I don't know. But like the things that I find where I'm getting the most insight are these small little moments where I just start to recognize, like, oh, there's an edge, and either I, maybe I didn't have to cross it, or maybe I could have come at it from a slightly different way. So. Here's another one. I was, uh, and there's, I've, I've got maybe six or seven on here. So um, once I was working with uh, some interns that we had, and we were harvesting firewood, and I was teaching them how to use the chainsaw safely and how to do felling safely. So my, I had a goal in mind, and I was very focused. And when you're teaching chainsaw safety, at least when I teach it, I, I am very, very much emphasizing the safety portion of it. So I try to stay super focused and not miss any details. So we're out there and we're talking about all the safety things and we're, we're working on felling the trees and I picked out the tree and, um, and I was explaining to them there's a whole st set of steps you go through to drop the tree safely and, uh, and, and we got to the step where you're looking at the tree to just assess it and I'm looking and I saw a big snapped off branch up, up in the tree and so you can often work with that, that's not a deal breaker for felling a tree but I, I was sitting there and, and it was strictly a gut feeling. Like I had my science feeling. I can see the branch and I know how gravity works, and so I know that, that could be dangerous. Um, but I also had my gut feeling, which was saying, walk away from this tree, don't cut it down. And so we had done all of our setup, I cleared all the branches, we had cleared our escape route, everything we had done, all of our, our work to fell that one tree, and I had to say to my interns, oh, we gotta go somewhere else. So we just we grabbed all our stuff and we went away and uh, and the most interesting thing happened the next Sunday when I was up in my woods just taking a walk and I went back up to that area and what I saw was that um, that huge branch had come crashing down right in the spot where I would have been doing the chainsaw, where I had set up to make my cut where I would have been physically positioned is where right where the branch fell. Um, and, and it happened during that intervening week just within those seven days. And so that branch was like ready to go. I could have been there, and my vibrating the tree by hitting with the chainsaw could have been enough to send it down. It didn't take much, whatever, because it, it was it fell seven days later. So that was a good indicator, and that, that was a positive outcome. Where I was like, oh, I listened, and that tree was telling me something, and I got the message. And thankfully, I did because I walked away from it, you know, without even being around when a dangerous thing happened. That branch falling down. So. All right. There was another. There's another time. I, I in my woods, I have like I have a deal with my woods, um, and it, it has to do with girdling. So I have a lot of low quality pine trees in one section of my woods, and my forester um, has encouraged me to girdle them. In fact, it's written in my forestry plan, so technically I'm required to, to do this girdling project. And girdling is when you cut the a strip of bark off of the tree with a chainsaw, and it cuts through the cambium layer, which is where all the nutrients go up and down in the tree, and it kills the tree slowly over the course of two or three, four years. Um, and so you do this with low quality stems uh, because they die and the branches fall off one at a time while the, remain, while the trees around it are growing up, and so it's less destructive to the, to the forest around, rather than felling them where they fall on top of everything and make a big mess. Um, and so uh, girdling is like a standard practice, but in my personal relationship with my woods, I kind of came to this agreement with my woods that I, I didn't feel comfortable girdling. 
just me. I'm not making any judgments about girdling in general. I've done it for customers when they require it, so I'm not opposed to the concept. I'm just clarifying that. Um, but in my woods, I, I, I even talked to my forester. I was like, can I just fell them instead of girdling them? And he said, no, I, you know, well, what are you talking about? Why do you want to do that? It's a lot more work. And I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm a chainsaw safety instructor. I know how to fell trees. I just feel better about felling them. And I'll, I'll do it directionally, and I'll make sure that I don't damage the, the woods. He's like, oh, do whatever you want. That's fine. So that's my deal. I don't curl in my woods. I just fell. So I was out working in that section, and I was felling trees. And I came to a tree, and, and it was leaning downhill. And there was a big, beautiful apple tree right below it. Um, and, and I was looking at it, and I thought, and I'm checking in with the tree, like doing a, you know, like my metaphysical thing, not just my science thing, trying to be like, okay, do you, is this, and, and what I'm hearing from the tree is, you should girdle. And I'm thinking, I, I don't girdle trees. I've got this deal, you know, like with the woods, and, and, and I don't girdle trees. And I'm, but this, I keep getting this message that I should girdle the tree. So I'm thinking, okay, and maybe I should girdle this tree. And you know, from a science perspective, that actually made more sense because it was it was a big ugly tree and it was leaning over a tree I didn't want to damage. And, but then, but then my ego was like, no, I have this deal and I'm going to stick to my deal. I'm not going to listen to the tree because maybe it's just something else. I don't know what's going on. And I and so I dropped the tree. So I set it all up. I did my directional fell to get it off of the apple tree, um, and I made my final cut to release the tree, and it just goes not where I want it to go. It goes right off, snaps right off the hinge, and it falls on the apple tree. It crushes the apple tree completely, right to the ground. A huge apple tree. And, and then it gets hung up so that the major trunk of the pine tree is about 12 feet in the air, and I can't get to it because it's down the hill, and I can't, I can't, you know, I'm trying to cut up the trunk, and the trunk itself is getting too high for me to work safely with the chainsaw. Um, and, and it's also over one of our walking trails. So, so, so now I'm, I'm sitting there like with, with a gigantic mess on my hands and a tree that I was that was the most important tree to save, the apple tree, totally ruined. And uh, and my trail now inaccessible for me because I can't walk under this tree. Um, and so, so I have a mess. So I have a mess. And so, what was the takeaway from that one was like. I should have listened to the tree. I was trying to communicate. I was trying to do this thing that I'm trying to do, check in, listen. But I was also trying to honor this relationship deal that I have with the trees. But in that, in that one instance, if I had listened, I would have actually girdled the tree, I would have walked away, and everything would have been fine. Um, and that tree would be dead now. And the apple tree would be alive. So, um, you know, it's that was enough years ago that it's all started to come down. That apple tree is still just like a, a split stump laying on the ground um, underneath it. So, um, I was just there a couple weeks ago, and that reminded me of the story. Um, so, all right, let's see. You want a couple more? We can get the end here. Okay. All right, so. So. You know, I, I earn my living, you know, with sawmill and, and by selling lumber and building buildings with the wood that I saw, um, sometimes doing small-scale logging jobs for people. So uh, I had a year and I, and I was really feeling like I was not uh, in my own woods enough, like I was doing a lot of jobs for other people and I really wanted to get into my woods, but I couldn't find a way to make that pay, to make it work for me, um, you know, to make enough money to pay the mortgage. And so, um, so I got a feeling like I should go up and talk to the woods about this. So, because the woods is where I want to be, and that's where I'm getting some of my income from. So, so I went up and talked to the woods. So I just went up, and when I say talk to the woods, for me what that means is just sitting there and, and thinking and listening, thinking and listening, and trying to be open to any ideas. And, as I said before, putting my intentions out there, okay? So basically what that meant was going up in the woods and putting my intentions out there and saying, I really want to make some money from you, the woods, um, because I'd like to spend more time up here. And, you know, I didn't hear any angel choirs singing or anything. I just put it out there and I walked back down and went about my business. And, uh, but when, a week later, I got, what well, for me was very unusual, has never happened before or since, was somebody showed up and wanted 12,000 feet of lumber to build a cabin just down the road from me. And they wanted it from the, the kind of wood that I had in my woods to harvest. And all of a sudden, I got to spend a whole month in my woods making good money uh, harvesting trees that were on, you know, that were scheduled to be harvested in my forestry plant. Um, so, again, 
if you're a science person, you're going to be like, that's just coincidence. There's like nothing special about that. But that's where the be open-minded part comes in, where I was talking about. Like you want to be able to think like, okay, maybe, maybe it's not a spiritual thing, but maybe it is. Maybe there's something there. So being open-minded enough to recognize that that coincidence might actually have a meaning. Um, and that's what that one did for me. So that was great. I felt really grateful. I was really thankful to be able to work in my woods, and I felt like it was a good way to build a relationship with my woods and, and, and learn a lot more about my woods by just being up there and dropping trees and pulling stuff out. Um, so, all right, so here, uh, this is probably the last one. Um, but this one, this one is, is, big, is very interesting and uh, from, a, from a lot of perspectives. So um, this is more, more like a disaster story one. So I was doing a clearing job for somebody in their yard. So I was dropping trees that were around their, their cabin and their garage. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'm very good at felling trees directionally. Like, you know, I, I teach how to do it, and I'm quite good at it. So trees will usually go where I want them to go. Um, and so and if, they, if I'm worried at all that they're not, there's sort of rot or something that makes it unpredictable where I can't, they can't make it do what I want it to do. I usually put a cable on it or put, you know, tie it ropes, you know, and I, I put in insurance policies, I call them, to make sure the trees do what I want them to do. So I was I was felling uh, two pine trees that were growing together from a single stem. So there was a single stem down on the ground, and it was a single stem for about three feet, and then it split into two tops. And they went up, you know, 40 or 50 feet, but they were only about this big in diameter, so maybe 10 inches, you know, sizable, but not huge. Um, and so I did my thing. You know, they're right next to the house, and one of them was leaning over the house, and one of them was leaning, you know, alongside the house. And I checked in with the trees, and I didn't hear anything. And, you know, no yes, no, or anything. But I checked in. It was just like, okay, this is what I want to do. I need your help. I want you. To, I want you to fall this way. And I read the trees. I read the lean. I did all of my things that I go through for safety, and I, and everything came up with a green light. So I wasn't getting any red flags, and so I made my initial cuts at the bottom of the tree, and without getting into the technical side of it, which I would, which I do in my class, um, I made my first cut. Everything was by the math correct, and I had good solid wood to create the hinge that determines where the tree is going to fall. So it was a green light. It looked really good, and then I made my back cut. Everything still looked good. There's no rot in the trees. I'm not seeing any seams of bark or anything that would make me think that something was going to go wrong at that point. And then I make my final cut, which would release the tree and let it fall. And I make the final cut, and instantly, one half of the tree goes right where I want it to go, perfect. And half leaning over the house comes smashing down right on top of the house. And the tree just split in two and, and totally landed like right smack on the roof of the house. Um, you know, worst possible scenario, like for me, because you know, I'm like that. That's my. I'm just seeing my insurance policy disappearing. You know, because <laughs> you know, because when you do the work that I do, your insurance agent usually tells you you've got an insurance policy, but if you ever use it, you'll probably not get it renewed. They won't renew it for you. So, I just it was a, potentially the, like the biggest disaster. You know that it happened to me. So. Um, got this huge tree. It's like falling on their house. It's 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 laying on the roof. Um, and so I, like, I just start investigating and seeing what's happening. So I, I get a ladder out and I'm climbing up on the roof. Um, and it's, it's laying over the house and then sticking out like another 30 feet into the air beyond the house. And, and I climbed up there and I'm looking at it and, and what I saw was that the tree had fallen right, you know, they had a metal bestest chimney, those like shiny metal chimneys. Um, that, that was, and that went right up all the way through. And, the tree had fallen on their chimney, which also, in my as I was watching it happen, I'm like, no, like the worst thing possible. Um, and and uh, but it hit the chimney, and it and so the chimney is only this big, and the tree is only that big, and it hit the chimney and it smacked right in the middle of the chimney, and the chimney just dented like a saddle, and it held the tree up, and their brand new standing seam roof. Never got a scratch. Oh, like not a single branch touched the roof. Okay, I call up a buddy of mine who's who does uh, tree work. He came out and he like rigged up a bunch of pulleys and all these kind of tricks that I don't know how to do because I'm you know I'm not an arborist. I'm just I'm more of a logger. 
But he had all the arborist tools, and he hooked up all these pulleys, and he just lifted the tree off the house, and he swung it over, and he set it down. And I went up there, and I took two sections of metal bestest pipe off. I bought two brand new sections, and I put them back on, and it was like five hundred dollars of metal bestest pipes, and that was it. And there was not a bit of damage in the house from the chimney getting smashed down. There was no damage to the roof. It was completely, like, there's no way I could conceive of a tree that size falling on a roof and not just destroying the roof, but it didn't. Now, was it because I talked to the tree and asked the tree for its help? I like to think so, because that's how I roll. But, <laughs> but, but you may think otherwise. You may think just as a coincidence. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, everyone can have their own interpretation of what went on there. But for me, that's where I can start. That's a trust building exercise. Like I'm like, OK. And without going into the details again, the reason that happened was that there was a very complex thing happening in the base of the tree where there was a huge bark seam that was, that was shaped like a crescent moon. It was very unusual that the tree, instead of growing with two stems together, one of the stems had actually formed a crescent of live material with a bark pocket that went all the way down into the roots at the bottom. And so, and for me, I couldn't see that. All of my cuts just looked like sound wood. The bark pocket just happened to be right where I made my hinge, completely hidden from me. Um, totally fluky. Like really, I took a photograph of it because it was so bizarre. Um, and but I had no way of knowing that from the cuts that I made. And so as soon as I made my release cut, the hinge didn't work. Like there was no hinge. It was all just bark in there. Um, and and so the tree that was leaning, both trees just went where they wanted to go. Um, and I had thought it was a single mass. From everything I could see, it, it was telling me that it was a single trunk that would fall together as one unit. But it wasn't. So that's the technical end of it. And there it is, trust building. So I could learn those kind of incidents for me, help me build that relationship, that communication. I communicated. I, got a, I didn't get a message, but I did my best to communicate. The tree did its best to help me out, given that it's not going to like defy the laws of gravity and physics, but it did fall in the best possible worst place. <laughs> so, okay, so it's eight o'clock. That's my talk. So thank you all for coming. For those of us for whom sit in the woods and be quiet is our natural inclination, do you have any recommendations for how to start to go in that? How do I interact with my woods in a more like working relationship yeah. or other kinds of things like that? Oh yeah, yeah, and, that, and like the simplest thing is to get a really high quality pocket folding saw and always take it with you when you go out into the woods. And you can even bring a pair of loppers, you know. So bring a tool. That's that's what I would say. So. Um, you know, my dad, you know, who I sort of learned how to re relate to woods with, never goes to the woods without a tool, ever. You know, even if he's just going out for a short Sunday afternoon walk, he's got a tool with him and he's chopping and hacking and, you know, and, you know all the time. So that's the way I learned to relate to it. So if you're used to sitting still, start bringing a tool with you and start asking yourself, where, where can I use this tool? Where does the woods want me to use? Tool, where can I improve my relationship with the woods by using this tool? So building trails in your woods is a fantastic way to start interacting with individual trees and your woods as a whole. And so building a, bringing a tool with that can help you build a trail, even if it's just clearing a few of those pokey branches out you know, from between two trees, that is a great way to start building your relationship on the working end of the spectrum rather than the, the contemplative end of the spectrum. Anything else? Yeah? What do you say to a tree before you cut it down? Basically, I say, is this OK? And sometimes, if I have time, I'll say, this is what I plan to do with you. Mm -hmm. And this is, what, this is why I'm cutting you down. 
And I usually put my hand on the tree, again, if I have time. You know, like I don't always get that option because I'm, I also have to pay the mortgage and I need to do things you know, efficiently. But I try to check in with every tree. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes I forget. If I have time, I check in real good. And I'm just like, I want to do this. I want to build, I'm building a cabin, I'm building a barn. Um, I need materials or I have a lumber order. Do you want to be part of this? You want to work with me in partnership to make this happen? And then you wait for an answer. And no answer, I go with what I understand from forestry. I go with the science end of things because I have a job to do and, and I have my woods to relate to and I have a forestry plan to follow. But if I get a no, I walk away. That's the deal for me. So if I get any gut sense not to do it, I walk away. There's a tree here at Yestermile. The Yestermile has asked me to cut down for the last six years. And every time I go over that tree, I get a no. So I haven't cut that tree down yet. Um, someday I might get a yes. I went and looked at it again today because it's yeah, because now because this is interesting, because like that's a tree now that I have like a longer term relationship with. Because I keep going back to that tree and having a conversation with that tree. Um, and so, and it's like a tree that I, I, I now like feel like as a friend. It's actually going to be harder to cut down now because it's like it will be gone if I do that. But when I checked in with it today, I was getting a little more of a like, eh, maybe sometime soon. So we'll see. I don't know. No. It's also leaning over a power line, which is a lot of the no. <laughs> there's a practical side to it as well. Have you ever gotten any unsolicited uh, messages back from clients who've received the wood? that have said something that, you know, you wouldn't have prompted in part of this experience you have that they're like uh, expressing that the wood is somehow talking to them now and it's new life? Never. <laughs> that would be an interesting thing to kind of follow That would be off. super cool. Yeah. I, I think that would be awesome if that would happen. Uh, no, the closest thing has been like some of the students in who have like given some pieces of wood to here at Yes Tomorrow who have built really amazing things. like they can sort of hear that wood talking and, and, and I can hear through them like that way. And that has happened once or twice with some really special pieces. And that was pretty cool. Um, that's pretty rare. Mm. So I did, you know, I, like, I had a random thing happen last week. So I had a sawmill job last week and uh, it was, it was uh, uh, hemlock and pine, white pine and hemlock. And I had nothing to do with the harvest. It was a big machine harvest. They, cleared a huge landing. I never even saw the woods. You know, I could see it in, in the distance, but you know, I was just set up in the open area where the log landing was with my sawmill, and I was just doing a custom sawmill job. Saw this all into you know boards and two by sixes and stuff. So, but just I was there, and I'm just like checking in with the logs, and and I get I get what I consider a very weird response because the pine is like we're good to go with this. This is great, and then I check in with the hemlock, and they're like we should not have been cut down. And I was like, and, and I'm thinking, I don't have anything to do with that, you know? Like, so, like, so I don't quite know what to do with that. But I just consider, so when I get things where I don't know what to do with it, I, I just file it in the, like, building relationships category. Like, I'm just practicing. Like, you know, I'm practicing talking with trees. And so that was practicing listening and getting messages. I can't describe meaning to it. And in that case, I couldn't actually even do anything, you know, like, uh, that customer was not one who was going to be particularly open to me telling them that, was really that they were cut down. And at that point, they're already cut down. There's not a lot that can happen. Um, but, I, but I checked it anyways, and like, so they're like, so what? You, know, so you do, do sometimes get funny things. Like, um, but you know, as a forester, for, for me as a poor person working in the woods, the biggest weird thing is the no when you get a no. And that's the most obvious thing to be listening for. You know. Whether or not you hear, yes, I'm going to be cutting the tree. I'm out there with a chainsaw harvesting wood. That's my job. But, but listening for the no is the, is the hard part. And, and responding to it is like that. So, yeah. Anything else? All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.